get started with uh, panel number two, which is the railroad panel. Um, I know it's a little bit cold in here. We're trying to check on that. Uh, I'm hoping that will be remedied soon. Um, why don't we start, as we always do, with uh, the panel on the, my left, uh, CP. Well, good morning. Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Miller, Commissioner Begaman. Um, I'm proud to be here to represent Canadian Pacific today to uh, help provide some of the transparency that folks have asked for and we've talked about uh, already this morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit um, about our rail service, um, some of the things that we've dealt with and, and where we think we're going specifically in our grain business. My name is John Brooks. I'm our vice president of our bulk business. I'm based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, my responsibilities specifically are for the marketing and sales functions within Canada and the United States for our grain business, our coal business, and our fertilizer business. I'm going to focus my comments today on, on ultimately three, three areas. One, collaborating with our customers and we are, where we are at in that process. Number two, infrastructure investments and what CP has done and will continue to do. And then number three, our efforts to continue to hire people to better strengthen and protect our commodities that we move across our Upper Plains network. But I think it's important for me to start talking a little bit about our franchise in the Upper Midwest. Unlike the U.S. carriers in the West, CP's franchise, when we move our commodities both East and West from the Upper Plains, are very dependent on our connecting carriers. So whether we go East to the Northeast U.S., through the Twin Cities or Chicago Gateway, or whether we're going west to the Pacific Northwest, we have a dependency on interchange connections to reach those marketplaces. It's critical to understand this and whether we're moving grain, crude, crude related products, frac sand, you name it. These products and their origins and destinations require interchange fluidity for our products. In many cases, CP requires two or three connecting carriers to reach our marketplaces. It's important to recognize this because this at times will impact our cycle times and flows and service levels we provide. As a point of reference, I think it's important to also point out that CP recognizes our rail service is critical to all the shippers. Shippers represented today here in the room in North Dakota and across the, our total Upper Plains network. But with that, CP's market share based on production for our grain and grain products in North Dakota typically falls in the 20 to 23 percent range. That is critical. In Minnesota, it's approximately 9 percent. And as we look at our crude business, we represent about 11% of the crude that's shipped out of North Dakota. As you think about CP's network, and our movement of grain and grain products, and all of our crude related products, this is a growing business area, and we expect to continue to haul more of these products. But I can assure you, CP is not favoring the movement of one commodity over another commodity. We are committed to work with all of our customers to try to move these in the most efficient manner from our Upper Plains network. As we look back over the past year, I think it's critical as we think specifically about grain that I reinforce a couple points today and try to provide some of the transparency 
that the folks are asking for. First, as we look at North Dakota, despite some, one of the worst winters on record and ongoing related St. Paul and Chicago congestion, CP's grain billings of our grain and grain products business are in line with our historical performance and the market share that we would expect to move based on the crop size. CP has moved approximately 5% more grain than our three-year average, and last year's crop production in North Dakota was up approximately 6% over that same time period. Last fall through early winter, we had a strong operating performance. We moved historical records of grain and grain products from the both United States and Canada to market. As reference, I can tell you specifically in the month of October, the Canadian Pacific moved its all-time record volume to the Pacific Northwest marketplace out of our U.S. franchise. This, the majority of this grain was hauled out of the state of North Dakota. Unfortunately, as December hit and into the spring, severe winter weather, flooding, and the related congestion to Chicago gridlock and Twin City gridlock definitely impacted our business. These events exposed our dependency and the rail business dependency on interchanges and our eastern carriers. At the same time, CP felt unprecedented levels of car requests to flow to these eastern, eastern markets. Following that period, CP has worked hard with our customers, and we recognize in many cases the communication wasn't the best and needed to improve, but we worked hard with our customers to recover following this period. Since the beginning of April, we have moved 9% more grain than our three-year average, and from a workload perspective, over the same period, we've moved approximately 26% more RTMs of the revenue ton miles. So where are we at today? Let's start with our open request system. <clears throat> the open request system allowed customers to enter as many free car requests as they desired without any consideration of one, our, our weekly ability to supply those cars, market flows where those cars were going, or market demand. There was no doubt it was our system, um, and it was a severe weakness of our system. Unfortunately, as we've heard from many folks, our U.S. requests grew to over 40,000 as we were flooded with unprecedented levels of car requests. Now I can tell you, um, we've looked long and hard at these requests to try to sort through them. I'm going to get into the details of, of our findings. Um, but in comparison, at the end of the previous crop year, CP had about 30 open requests in total. To put the spike that we received this last year of requests into further context, if CP would have met 100% of this demand in the state of North Dakota, our market share would have spiked by over 40%. So why did this happen? And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons and, and certainly still uncertainty on our side. Um, but it seems like there was a perfect storm of factors that contributed to this extreme, unprecedented level of car requests that we received, including weather and interchange congestion that I spoke about, certainly market factors and directional flows, the volume of traffic that needed to move, or at least was requested to move, to go to St. Paul into Chicago during the fall and winter months. Certainly competitive rail dynamics and transportations 
car costs in the marketplace, and potentially higher levels of Canadian grain that, was, that, that flowed into the United States, into the United States. I think all these factors played a role. Um, at the end, the result was CP's car request exceeded what we were expected to move and could possibly ship. So more importantly, let's talk about what we're doing about it. Again, I'm going to go back to the three elements that I started with. One, we're going to talk about the collaboration and where we're at with our customers and our new train system that was brought up earlier. Infrastructure investments, I want to touch on those, try to bring some more clarity to, to what we're doing. And then three, talk about hiring folks. Number one, we are working with our customers to improve communication. We know that this was raised in the last hearing. It's been raised already again today. I have personal accountability to, to improve that communication. Number two, part of that communication that that we are having with our customers is to really roll back and understand the demand that they need for our service. What is really out there? When does it need to move? And then how we go about putting the, the plans in place to move it. And rolling out and changing our car request system because we are, we are not gonna go into the new crop here with, with a similar system. So, number one, let's talk about it. Working directly with our customers to understand their needs, both in the near term, so what needs to get moved out now, and then what needs to move for the entire crop year. No doubt this process has included cleaning up old requests that shippers have to markets that no longer exist, or, flank, frankly, are longer required any more cars. Further, CP has initiated discussions, and let me emphasize this, over 10 months ago with our shippers around a new car ordering system. This has been in the plans and has continues to be in the plans for months now. These dialogues have been collaborative. They've been in the means of trying to ask our shippers what new system works best for them as our intentions have been to introduce this now for many months. The intention of the new program is threefold. One, we want to provide more transparency to what our shippers can expect. Number two, certainty. If they know what they can expect and what they have for cars, or trains in this case, then they can plan around it and can plan their sales to those trains. And then three, we need to provide a platform for growth. And we think between the capacity enhancements that CP will continue to make and our new program, we will be providing a platform so our customers can grow. So we have spent the past couple months working with the customers to understand their needs. They have canceled request as we work to make an orderly transition into our dedicated train program. Allegations that CP has strong arm bullied shippers into canceling requests are not fact-based. CP and our customers have made contractual commitments and established transition plans to run dedicated trains. By the end of this week, we expect to have 18 dedicated trains in service and running on our network. This number will continue to grow on a weekly basis as we transition out of requests and into dedicated trains. This reflects, and we believe will reflect, real demand for our service from our shippers. And as a result, we've seen a drop in the open requests to now approximately about 6,200 open requests older than 14 days. 
The remaining 6,200 car requests that are out there, approximately 2,000 of those are for trains that are in transition into a dedicated train product. The remaining 4,200 are for less than train orders. CP is committed to work with those less than trained shippers. There's still a lot of work for us to do to understand the validity, the need for those less than train orders. But I can assure you, our intention is to fill every one of those if they are required. Our operating team will focus on those less than train orders and we will fill them oldest orders first to get those completed. Let's talk a little bit about infrastructure investments. Between 2009 and 2013, we invested more than $700 million to sustain and expand capacity in our Upper Plains states. This includes approximately $200 million in North Dakota. Looking forward, CP is planning to make record levels of capital investments in our property. Depending on demand levels, we expect investment in the Upper Plains to exceed $500 million between 2014 and 2016. This includes additional and extended sidings, route contingency plans, and a full upgrade to centralized train control from Canada to St. Paul. These enhancements will not only improve in safety on our railroad, but also capacity to our network to the benefit of all of our shippers. In Chicago and St. Paul, CP is leading efforts through the coordination with other railroads to attempt to enhance the throughput through these terminals. We recently invested millions of dollars to install an automatic switch in our St. Paul yard area to allow directional running across our own railroad. We believe this will enhance and protect our traffic flows that are required to go east through the St. Paul area and ultimately to and from Chicago. Our marketing and sales team is working hard with all of our shippers as we come into this winter to determine route contingencies for our customers to avoid the St. Paul and Chicago markets. We are working with marketers on both the origin and destination side in the Northeast US to put plans in place to route over our own railroad up through Canada and back down into the Northeast US to try to avoid some of these critical congestion areas. Hiring people. North Dakota's robust economy has created strong competition for employees in the communities we serve and certainly all the grain elevators and businesses we serve through North Dakota. It's no doubt CP is also facing those challenges. We are actively recruiting employees to ensure that CP is positioned to sustain movements to the best of our ability through these Upper Plains communities. Training classes have been underway throughout the year and we are actively bringing on new hires across our entire Upper Plains system. In North Dakota, we are buying housing, providing temporary living, and offering as many competitive compensation alternatives to employees as possible to retain them and attract them to Canadian Pacific. We currently have either being hired in training or marking up today a plan for approximately 400 additional employees. In 
In closing, I want to reiterate that CP is focused on understanding, improving communication with our customers, and again, I am accountable for that, and developing reasonable expectations for service. This is job one. We realize it. We are not favoring one commodity over another, and we are certainly not ignoring our U.S. business because of orders in Canada. We are investing and will continue to invest significant amounts of capital enhancements, as well as look at all options to move more traffic through the Twin Cities and Chicago. We will work through the challenges described and expect to deliver lift and move more products as we move into this peak season. Thank you. Yep. We'll now hear from BNSF, Mr. Bob and Mr. Lees. Good morning, uh, Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Miller, and Commissioner Begeman. I'm Steve Bob, Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for BNSF. Accompanying me is Bob Lees, Vice President, Service Design and Performance. We're here to address some specific questions and issues raised in your hearing order. You routinely receive a lot of reporting from us, so we won't take time to rehash much of what you already have. The spe specific items I will address are, first, review our progress to date, specifically agricultural products. Second, provide BNSF shuttle turn time information. Third, provide a service improvement outlook and time frame. And fourth, address the question, is there more action yet to be taken? Before I progress, I do want to acknowledge that we have customers present here today. Your business is important to us, and as we've indicated previously, we know our service has not met your needs. Nor have we met the needs of Amtrak and commuter rail. Beyond safe operations, nothing is a higher priority than restoring the fluidity of our network. It's appropriate since we're in North Dakota, to comment on how this state is literally ground zero for economic and rail volume growth, not just in this region, but in the entire country. Each dot on this map represents a rail-served customer facility that began shipping between 2010 and July of this year, or will be operational by year end. Examples of these facilities include lumber transloads, construction product transloads, chemical transloads, petroleum facilities, grain facilities, and grain products facilities. You may remember from my last appearance that 2013 shipments to or from North Dakota represented 40% of BNSF volume growth and 20% of industry growth. That growth rate continues to be strong again this year. However, as we're all aware, with this growth has come challenges. I want to first give you a BNSF progress update. Much of this detail is not new to those in attendance. We included in the information submitted to the Surface Transportation Board, we posted on our website, and we've been sharing it with producers and shippers in the multiple meetings we have had in North Dakota. We are or are ahead of plan to add resources, and those resources are making a difference already. September and October track work in particular will enable another step level in capacity in terms of overall performance. The good news is we've improved terminal dwell, reduced trains holding for power, and improved on-time performance. However, train speeds have not improved and are actually slower, impacted by continued volume, maintenance season, and weather-related service interruptions. There continues to be allegations that crude is favored over other commodities, especially agriculture. The fact of the matter, and one we are not proud of, is that both ag and crude fleet velocities are down the same amount year over year. We strongly believe that the investment we are making will result in a stronger railroad and will support more capacity and improved service for all customers and markets. We are seeing very good improvement in upper Midwest ag volumes with recent shipments higher than the past four years. Additionally, year-to-date total shipments from North Dakota are a record volume. As we reported last week, August 28th U.S. past due stood at 2,029, an 88% decrease since March. North Dakota, the epicenter of our volume growth. North Dakota past dues were 1,016, an 88% decrease since March. Also as information, South Dakota past dues were 251, Minnesota were 61, 
and Montana were at 408. I expect that you will hear of many comments today that we are not moving as much coal as our customers would like. Additionally, you will hear that there are instances of our customers having to manage their burn rates given inventory levels. We are aware of these circumstances and know that while moving more coal year over year, we are not meeting demand. Our primary vol volume focus is to meet our contractual obligations and adjust best as possible where customers want to move more volume than their contract declaration. That said, there are also circumstances where we are not meeting our customer declarations. We have a network planning process that is informed by frequent communication with our customers. This allows us to make decisions to balance our resources across the network to move the most volume while identifying and addressing critical needs. As I mentioned already, we are seeing the benefits of resource additions to our network. Despite a significant rain cause track outage and ongoing track work, Coal movement during August was our best month since January. Investments in eastern Montana and North Dakota during September and October will further directly help coal volumes on our northern corridor. Additionally, those investments will enable traffic currently moving on reroutes to move back to the north, opening up much needed train slots on other parts of our network. Overall, we still have work to do. Rebuilding stockpiles will take place in 2015 with some completing in 2016. Before I move to our ag outlook, I want to briefly mention ethanol and propane, which were noted in your hearing notice. Ethanol volumes are up 7% year over year through July. We are not meeting demand. For propane, the upper Midwest experienced scarcity of supply last year due to several factors coming together at once. Looking ahead this season, as usual, weather will drive demand. Overall market storage and rail loading capacity have been increased and the capacity loss in a pipeline reversal will need to be replaced by several rail carriers and other pipelines. We continue to advise customers to fill storage early and be cognizant of transit times and equipment availability as they plan. I'd like to make some comments looking forward for grain markets. I committed to you in April that we would be reset in time for the upcoming harvest and we are. I'll also note that during the first half of the year, we have moved more grain and agricultural products than we did in the first half of 2013. Per your request, we are providing shuttle turns per month by region. As you can see, geography matters and influences cycle time. The volume mix across these lanes will impact our overall performance as we move forward. More demand to longer or slower turn regions will impact resources and ultimately volume handled. As we approach the harvest season, I do want to note that overall we are experiencing strong demand from nearly all of our customer segments and geographies we serve. As we complete preparations for harvest, we are currently moving back to an appropriate balance of grain cars in shuttle service. 27 shuttles of rail cars have been in non-shuttle service to help reduce past dues. To move maximum volume, we will need to complete shifting these rail cars back into shuttle service during September. This will reduce non-shuttle order fill rates from current levels and increase the number of past due orders. Maintaining shuttle service during the heavy demand will allow us to move the volumes at markets and subsequently our customers need us to move to meet demand. You can see the significant volume leverage provided by our shuttle network year to date. This October, our grain fleet will be split about 51% shuttles and 49% shuttles, which is a different mix than what you've seen thus far during the year. We expect this more appropriate balance will enable slightly over 50% of our rail cars and shuttle service to move 70% of our grain volume. We have sold record ag capacity for fall 2014 and winter 2015. This car capacity combined with expected fleet velocity should give us the capacity and capability to move record volumes. Note I said should. While we are fairly sure of a large harvest, we don't yet know what volumes will move to which markets and when. Egg markets, volumes, and timing of grain movement are impacted by many variables, including rail service. Weather, crop size, price, storage, geography of demand, etc. We may see farmers choose to not move crops. We may see markets swing from wanting grain, grain transportation to not wanting it, to wanting it again over a matter of months. This is the nature of the business that we serve. I believe that I can say with certainty a couple of things. We are much more capable to handle demand this year than last, and if a big crop wants to move all at once, 
or if we experience greater than historical demand into eastern domestic wheat milling markets, we could be running perfectly and past dues would grow and it could increase by several thousand or more. All that said, we expect our grain volumes year over year over the next four to six months to increase by 10 to 15 percent. Turning to a status update and timeline for our service improvement, there are a few things that turned out differently than we expected when I was last uh, providing you with an expectation. For the north, we expected frost heaves in the spring. However, the magnitude and duration was not expected. Thus, June service in the north was much worse than anticipated. For the central region, our coal velocity was negatively impacted by June reroutes off of the north, and then again for 16 days by flooding in July, followed by additional volume in August. We were correct that snowmelt wouldn't drive significant flooding events. Instead, significant rain events created the challenges. On the other hand, our overall progress at adding capacity and our grain recent reset went about as expected. For the Southern Transcon, we continue to improve as the majority of the significant track work projects are winding down. Capacity projects to address remaining Southern Transcon bottlenecks are targeted for 2015 delivery. In the central region, this region has been challenged as a result of weather impacts on the north and continued high demand for coal. We foresee more gradual improvement as we may continue to as we continue to operate a very high number of coal sets towards all destinations. While track work programs in this heavy haul route approach the two-thirds point of completion. The Northern Transcon continues to see incremental improvements as capacity projects come online. Progress is uneven as we have continued traffic recovery efforts stemming from outages caused by heavy rains in late August. Heavy maintenance programs will continue into the fall, which are necessary to continue improving the fluidity of the network, but impact short-term velocity. If you look at our Northern Transcon route from Fargo, North Dakota West, as we complete these track improvement projects in October, this will be a different railroad with capacity that is uh, significantly increased over any time in our prior history in this part of the, of the country. Regarding your question on solutions to rail capacity challenges, let me start by saying that the BNSF network and the U.S. rail network are experiencing tight capacity with current volume demands. BNSF and the rest of the industry are investing in the necessary additional capacity. As this key private sector solution investment occurs, we believe that there are also other private sector solutions that are underway or have been attempted. Ultimately, increased capacity is a key solution and we are well along and in some cases ahead of plan in all facets of capacity, people, maintenance, rail, terminal, locomotives, and rail cars. This information is provided as part of our ongoing weekly update. We also continue to stay in close communication with our customers so they know what to expect and we know about critical needs. While not able to successfully react to every customer support call, I believe our team has done a very good job under difficult circumstances of fielding the calls and attempting solutions. We also have worked with our customers to make commercial adjustments. For example, providing coal contract flexibility where that could make a difference. We also recently worked with a regional short line to ensure that we had rates in place to provide an option for grain moves to a couple of higher velocity BNSF served destinations. We recognize the need to improve our service, particularly in the upper Midwest. However, more extreme regulatory actions, as you stated in the hearing order, should not benefit one industry at the expense of others or spur unintended consequences, with the overall impact of moving less total volume and reducing service levels for other commodities. We are the largest carrier in the national freight rail network, and we urge you to be mindful of the impact of calling out particular segments on the fluidity of the network as a whole. Examples of regulatory action that could negatively impact our customers include, as we have discussed, the need for more capacity and an action that forces more rail cars onto our system, either private cars to move on BNSF or cars for BNSF to handle to or from another carrier will not create more capacity. It will reduce capacity and some BNSF customer volumes will be negatively impacted. You have heard a couple of requests this morning to allow another railroad onto already congested subdivisions. This will not create more capacity. Again, some BNSF customer volume will be negatively impacted. 
You have heard and read testimony from other witnesses requesting regulatory action that mandates commodity or geography preferences. As we stated earlier, this will not create more capacity. BNSF customer volume will be negatively impacted as the chosen commodity or region will move at the expense of all others. The recent Canadian directive on grain is instructive as the impacts of such a course. BNSF has already received requests for additional volume out of Canada as we are staying focused on our existing customers. These Canadian customers are seeking relief by jumping into the U.S. system as a better alternative. From the standpoint of what you should do, I can point out two things. First, assess the total volumes we are handling and hold us accountable for our commitments to add capacity to grow that volume. Second, recognize that we have processes to deal with customer issues. Examples are how we balance resources to deal with critical coal inventory levels and how we've balanced resources to become current on single car past two grain orders. Additionally, to the public policymakers in attendance, we would also ask that you assess the impacts of public policy choices on rail capacity and the rail network ability to handle volume growth. Some individual examples at play here are potential crude by rail train speed regulations or positive train control implementation timelines, as well as accumulative effects of all regulatory actions over time on rail capacity. An example of a public policy choice having a positive effect is the streamlined permitting process that now occurs in North Dakota. Thank you, Governor Dalrymple, your support in this area as we have installed new capacity has, very, has been very impactful. Also, I appreciate recognition of uh, what we've done to date. That said, we know we have more to do. I'll finish where I concluded last time I was before you. We're going to invest whatever it takes to handle all of our customers' business, both current and future. Commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to provide a progress update and answer your questions. We are happy to address further questions that you may have. Okay, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, Chairman Elliott, Vice Chairman Miller, and Commissioner Begman. I'm David Brown, Chief Operating Officer for Genesee in Wyoming. Uh, and Rapid City Pier and Eastern Railroad is a fairly recently created railroad company for G&W to operate, or for RCP&E to operate a 670-mile railroad that was, and other assets that were acquired from Canadian Pacific around the first of the year. So since the first of the year, we've been in an, in an intense uh, planning process and preparation process to begin operation of RCP&E, which started on, in, on June 1st. Um, and I must say we're delighted to do business in South Dakota. Uh, we certainly uh, we see ourselves as South Dakota's railroad, uh, a, a short line railroad that, that connects to uh, three class one partners. And uh, we, uh, since June, during the, at least the initial phase of uh, the startup of Rapid City Pier and Eastern Railroad, since June 1, focus was to establish safe and efficient protocols and procedures to hire, train, and orient almost 200 new employees and to deploy assets necessary to safely meet the initial perceived needs of the communities and customers served by the railroad. This work is largely complete. We're three months into operations. Concurrent with the startup, RCP&E management became acutely aware of the growing backlog of grain awaiting transport out of the state. Elevators were near capacity while facing a series of expected bumper crops through the balance of 2014. Action was taken to secure or accelerate additional crews, locomotives, and freight cars. Also, an ongoing and intense effort began to coordinate actions with connecting Class 1 freight railroads. While much more work remains to be done over the last three weeks, promising gains have been made in addressing the backlog of grain. Our cp &E employees will continue their work to improve the situation as we continue to move forward in further weeks. And we've heard about transparent and open communications, and I want to talk about that a little bit. Because one of the things that we've instituted is a very open fact-based communication process and collaboration, especially with Governor Dugard and his staff. We created a fact sheet, which I've distributed. It's a one-page document that we periodically update. This is our second update, so I guess we say we periodically update it about on about a monthly basis. And you, you, I won't go through all the details, but these are the facts around additional people that we hired, around uh, locomotives that we, and working with our partner Canadian Pacific, have brought into South Dakota, into the RCP&E in order to increase the 
amount of uh, trains that we operate, additional grain cars that have either been leased or purchased uh, by rcp and &E to increase the size of the fleet as we have seen that the harvest demands additional equipment. And we also address an operating plan change that we made at the time of a meeting with Governor Dugard. It was facilitated by STB on August the 8th with CP and RCP and E, and we sat down and we created an, a change to our operating plan that added an additional three trains uh, out of South Dakota on a weekly basis to our original operating plan. So essentially adding the capacity to do about 50% more grain movements on a weekly basis uh, as we go forward and address the additional demand. We also talk about our investments and each week we update all of our constituencies around uh, whether it's the shipper community uh, or the, the government agencies that we're dealing with on the number of loads that we actually move from the state of South Dakota on a weekly basis. So we, uh, we have found as uh, the, the newcomer in South Dakota that the, we have, we've found a very engaged community of shippers. We found a very engaged uh, community of uh, elected officials. Uh, perhaps more than anywhere we operate, at least in the U.S., a very uh, strong understanding of how railroads operate and a partnership uh, willingness to understand the uh, important vital role that railroads play in the supply chain from harvest to market. So again, thank you for your time and for this opportunity to uh, update you on where RCP is on our new operation. Thank you. A few questions, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just uh, for CP, just a, a few cl clarification points. Um, I just wanted to make sure, you know, earlier you mentioned that uh, the cancellations that occur in your new dedicated train system are initiated by the shippers themselves. And uh, I'm sure there's some anecdotal uh, things going around out there that that's not the case. Um, so I just want to hear from you that you assure, you know, the shippers and especially the ag shippers here that that is in fact the case, that this is a decision by the customers themselves uh, to cancel what are considered open orders that they no longer need is that is that correct yes chairman so let me let me just talk a little bit <clears> about <throat> that so as i mentioned um number one i've personally been involved in a number of these discussions with our shippers um and as i stated many of these discussions started and have been taking place for months now this isn't as a result of the last couple of weeks this isn't a result of the last 60 days. This, uh, a lot of these discussions initiated back in January, February, or even before, uh, before 2014. Um, as part of our dedicated program, um, these shippers will now take full ownership of these trains and have the flexibility to run these trains from a variety of their origins to a variety of destinations. Um, really the intent is to try to create as much velocity as we can um, with these shippers. So as part of this, the, the shippers will no longer have requests in our network for specific spots on a given week. They will run and control these trains. So the, the, the effort has been with the customers to say, all right, if you're going to run X number of trains, and you have X number of requests in our system, what sort of transition plan do we need to put in place to move from the requests to the trains? We weren't gonna just snap our fingers and say, look, um, you get rid of all your requests and we'll start up on day one X number of trains. We've put transition plans in place over, um, in some cases, a couple months with shippers to say, all right, you're still gonna need this many requests and as we fulfill those, we'll start up trains. And, and, and that's really been the process. So um, yes, we, 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 as I said, um, the allegations of, of forcing um, the cancellation is not true. And, and, and I guess the other thing, Chairman, I'll mention, um, in many cases, our shippers have both train and less than train requests in place. And, all the less than train requests, if they want them and they need to remain and there's demand to be filled to them, as I stated, our intent is keep those in and we'll, we'll fill that demand. Uh, 
mentioned um, that s some of the requests were cleaned out because the markets no longer exist. I mean, what exactly does the markets no longer exist mean? Yeah, so you know, <clears throat> one of the instances that, that, that we've found is particularly during the fourth quarter of 2013 and early into the winter, we received a lot of requests for eastbound movements. And largely the market had shifted to wheat and, and that was the market for, for our grain. Well, we, we struggled and the challenges getting through St. Paul and Chicago to move that grain um, you know, were, were prevalent and well understood. Um, the issue was those car requests that weren't filled during that time period um, the markets there in many cases no longer exist. So that grain car uh, no longer wants to go to Chicago or beyond and now wants to be filled with corn or soybeans to go to another marketplace. So part of the effort has been saying, all right, if you still need the car, that's great. Let's get it in the system and let's get it reflecting exactly what you want to load in it, where you're going to load it from, and what markets is, it's going to go to. Um, I did notice um, in the, the, the significant uh, decrease in the, the number of open cars that you had. Um, and I've, I've seen other numbers, uh, you know, over time. I, I saw in a letter from um, your CEO, Mr. Harrison, that there was only a, a backlog of about a thousand cars in um, North Dakota itself, and can you, you know, kind of describe why there's a, that difference um, in the numbers that you're reporting today? Obviously, these numbers are very important. You heard it from the prior panel that to know really what's out there, we'd rather know the truth than what, or at least accurate numbers. Yep. Can you just describe that difference and why that's occurring? Yeah, so I guess first of all, we, you know, as I stated, about 6,200 open requests. We expect about 2,000 of those to be trains that are in transition. The remaining leaves about 4,200. Um, we still have a lot of work to do with those shippers to sort through to determine uh, when they need those, if those are valid, and, and how quickly we can get plans in place to, to supply those cars. Those discussions and, and those efforts are underway. As you look at historically what CP, CP has shipped um, based on crop production in North Dakota. And, and it's simple math. If we, if we take the crop production in North Dakota, look at the various commodities that were produced, and translate those into car loads, potential rail car loads, our market share sits at 20 to 23 percent historically. So if we do that against last year's crop, we've moved about exactly what we would expect to have moved, given that mathematical equation. And that puts us right in about that 1,000 car variation. Um, and, and how did you um, go about choosing um, customers that were going to be involved in the dedicated train program? I mean, was that made available to everyone, or were you, did you specifically seek out certain customers? Yeah. So. Um, you know, obviously we have a, a, a lot of historical relationship and in, in, in understanding of what shippers um, have facilities that are designed to ship trains or have a desire to ultimately run a train product. So it was largely the discussion with the customers, obviously, and also our knowledge of the facilities that have the capability to ship trains, and then we reached out to those shippers. I, I, we, are, we are invoking the, the exact same process um, with our Canadian shippers also. And so um, with that in mind, that means the, shipper, or the shippers that were not involved, that are not involved in the dedicated train program will still be able to seek cars um, in, I guess, an orderly manner uh, that will be filled by CP as well, just through a different a uh, system, a single car system, I assume? Yes, Chairman. Um, you know, part of the effort here, um, and uh, just to be very candid, we, um, 
with so many open requests in the system, and I've, I've pointed out the flaws to them uh, uh, of the system. Uh, we needed a way to really begin to segment out um, our, our two types of shipments. And w what we feel this will allow us to do is take our U.S. fleet and really understand and know exactly the demand and the number of trains we need to run. And then it will also let us exactly understand all the less than train shipments that will be out there. And those shippers will have the ability to put in requests for the less than trains just like they have in the past. But we truly believe it will give us a better visibility to exactly those shipments because it will be segmented out. Um, I can tell you the, the operating team um, has, we've instituted a, uh, a 70 two hour plan for all of our less than trained shippers. And what it's done is it brings visibility up to the top of CP's operating house in exactly what our plans are to fill these less than train orders, how we are pecking away at them, the progress we're going to make or not make on a weekly basis. But it's really begun to provide the visibility within CP that, to be quite honest, previously under the old system, we just didn't have. Um, and on to a, another topic. Um, with respect to the um, amount of money that's being spent on the infrastructure, you referenced uh, from 09 to 13 that you spent $700 million in this area alone, and then 14 through 16, you anticipate spending, what was it, $400 million? Is that? Yeah, 500. $500 million. Um, Do you believe, uh, with, well, first of all, how much of that money um, specifically is going to increase capacity that's dedicated to increasing like sightings or, or double tracking or things of that nature? Yeah, so um, as, as our CEO, Mr. Harrison, uh, referenced specifically in, in Minot a few weeks back, We've got about $150 million planned in the state of North Dakota, and that, that, is, that goes beyond um, you know, uh, regular blocking and tackling in terms of keeping the railroad running. So that, that gets to the centralized train control um, you know, from our Canadian property down into the Twin Cities. It gets to the point of you know, where, we, where do we need to extend sidings, where do we need to add sidings. Um, it, all those components. In light of the and the increase in uh, car loads that are on the U.S. system, um, including what's been going on in Chicago and what happened to you in St. Paul, um, do you believe that that is going to be an adequate number or do you anticipate um, based on, especially with the increase in the economy, I, I assume your intermodal is kicking up too, um, that that will be an adequate investment to uh, continue uh, the flow, or do you believe that we are um, in a time period where flow will just be slower than it has been in the past? You know, uh, Chairman, I, I think that's going to be an ongoing assessment. Um, I think a lot of it depends on, 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 on the markets and what develops with on, you know, on CP's franchise. I can tell you there's a, there's a big effort um, to try to differentiate ourselves and find new solutions in St. Paul and Chicago. Um, I, I think we expect that to be, um, um, again, very challenged coming into the fall and into the winter. Um, we, we've, we've added the, the, the redundancy um, to improve our route directionally through the Twin Cities, but we, we, we'd, we'd be fooling you if we, we didn't think there's no, more work that needs to be done there. You know, as it relates to Chicago, um, you know, we're, we're working hard with the other Class 1 carriers, but, but more importantly, the, the BRC, the IHB, the, the intermediate carriers there to, to find better solutions. Because, um, uh, as you stated, this, um, the traffic, our traffic requirements, but, um, you know, all the major car, uh, carriers' traffic requirements through that corridor um, are expected to increase. With respect to the, um, the employees, uh, you said that you were going to add a 400 additional employees. Are, are those um, new employee numbers on top of what you already have, or are those uh, to fill uh, tr tried spots in, in the system? 
Yeah, so there's, there's certainly an attrition factor with, within that, um, that, that that we're facing. So that's across our entire network. So that's um, from Harvey to Endelin and also down onto our, onto our um, uh, river subdivision down in Iowa, Mason City, Davenport, and Marquette. Um, those are the primary locations at which we're, we're adding people. And how many do you believe that you're adding uh, that aren't attrition spots? Yeah, okay. So we, we expect the attrition rate to be about 20% on that. So, you know, we, we'd be looking at somewhere of a net of uh, uh, whatever that math is, 100, 150 to 180. Do you believe that that will be adequate to satisfy what's coming up in this winter? Uh, we do. We do. Now, it's, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say, uh, you know, it's, it's been certainly a challenge um, to, to get the right folks in place, uh, particularly in North Dakota. Um, <clears throat> but our operating team and our HR team has been uh, uh, diligent in trying to be competitive. And, and as I know Mr. Harrison spoke about uh, uh, in, in our last meeting, we're working hard with our unions um, to try to bring some change um, uh, to some of those agreements that we believe will also give us some lift um, in that area. Thank you. Um, Vice Chairman. Thank you. So, Mr. Brooks, I'm curious, uh, going back to the issue of Chicago, yes. well, even more broadly than that, this is something I'm curious about with the CP Railroad Company. So it's my understanding in Chicago that there's this entity called CTCO, which is all the railroads cooperating together to try to solve Chicago problems, but CP doesn't participate in that. Can you explain to us the rationale and how it is that as an entity with a vested stake in how Chicago moves, um, CP's needs can be served if you don't participate in that cooperative undertaking? Vice Chairman Miller, um, and I, I, I am going to apologize to you up front. I, I'm not particularly well adversed in CP's position and is, is part of that group or not. I mean, I can tell you um, there's been extensive discussion with, with all those members and whether or not we decide ultimately to, to, to get back in that group or not, um, I, I can't give you an answer to that. Um, I, I know there are efforts being focused on with, as I mentioned to, to the chairman, with the BRC, the IHB, um, uh, which we utilize a lot for our interchange connections to find, try to find better alternatives to, to move that traffic through there. But, but I, I apologize, I, I can't specifically okay. answer that. So, on a different issue, but sort of related, at least as I've tried to, uh, in the short time I've been on the board, understand the, the data that is provided by railroads and do the comparisons, it's much more difficult to compare uh, the operating condition of the CP with the other railroads because the way you're reporting the data is not comparable. And can you explain that to us and why it is you don't report it in a way so that we can make direct comparisons with other railroads? Um, I, I guess I would need the details on specifically, uh, Vice Chairman Miller, if there's, if there's something, um, and I guess I'm not uh, aware of the discussions that uh, have taken place with, with our management on that, but if there's certainly something in particular that, that needs to be displayed or demonstrated in a different way, um, I, 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 I okay. wouldn't know why we wouldn't consider that. Okay, great. We could follow up on that. And then one of the things we heard this morning from Senator uh, Hoven is the concern that what we need is a very specific plan and understanding of what CP intends to do and that that plan really has not been provided. And so I, my sense is, is that you might say on behalf of the railroad that you feel like you do have that plan in place, but I think for many of the shippers and others, to the extent it's in place, it's not clear or understandable to us what the plan is. Could you describe it in more detail? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think this goes back to a plan that's been um, uh, in the workings for 10 plus months with, with our shippers. Um, um, and, and it really began with a recognition of we don't have a good handle on, on demand and part of it is this system. And, and why in fact, you know, have, have requests at unprecedented levels suddenly decided to come to Canadian Pacific's Railroad. We still don't have a good answer for that. 
Um, so the reality is we've said we've got to change our system. We've got to go to the customers and create a system that says, all right, we're going to run dedicated trains. And we think those dedicated trains will give us uh, a, a new product. It'll give our shippers transparency. They'll know what they have. It'll create capacity. It'll allow us to, to use tools such as power on on our grain trains to, to ensure that when trains are lifted, they're spotted uh, and, and, and filled in a timely manner. And then we're, we've got power on the site to, to run the train and, and launch the train to market as quickly as possible. Um, as, I, as I spoke about, it's the notion of, of breaking out our system um, so we have a clear visibility to the less than train orders, um, the smaller shippers, um, the shippers that want to ship 25s to, to uh, you know, markets across the country. So we have, we have better visibility and we can plan specifically around those. It's, it's the hiring plan. It's getting people in place in, in, in locations like Harvey and Enderlin so we can protect the traffic movements. It's the ongoing capacity improvements that we have made and will continue to make through, through North Dakota and the Upper Plains. You know, adding centralized train control uh, from Canada to the, uh, St. Paul is, is going to be a big capacity enhancement that has been well underway. Um, uh, so it, it's it's the component. All, it's all those components. You know, in terms of locomotives, um, we've been very consistent in, in stating we've we've got a, a good up-to-date fleet. Um, we've got the right number of locomotives to run the business. Uh, in terms of cars, um, you know, where we've needed to add cars, we've added cars. We don't see cars being the solution. Um, the cars need to move uh, and and brought, be brought up to a velocity to help us move more grain. And, and, and again, we believe our, our dedicated train product, product will help do that. And then the focus we can put on our, uh, our, our smaller, less than train shippers should also help to do that also. Um, you know, I can tell you one other thing that, um, you know, our team is actively managing is um, as, as we send cars, and, and we hadn't done a good job on it before, but if we send cars through Chicago, and to our eastern uh, destinations. We are now actively working and calling on our eastern destinations to get cars unloaded and get them back um, uh, because um, uh, that will certainly impact on a week-to-week -week basis the amount of service we can provide back here in the Upper Plains. Um, I'd be curious to come back and ask you another question about this issue of unloading cars, but I want to go back to the dedicated trains um, uh, before doing that. So can, can you, um, when you're talking about these dedicated train sets and going to your customers, your shippers, how many customers are we talking about? Does that mean five major customers? Are we talking about 35 shippers? I, I just, I don't have a sense of the, the magnitude. And, yeah. Um, now, I, again, I've got to be a little bit conscious of, of, of the shippers, and um, these are all confidential contracts, so I certainly need to, need to respect some of that. But, um, you know, we're talking about uh, 10 to 15 customers. And, 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 and I give you a range because we're, they're still in, sure. you know, somewhere still in discussions. Okay. And then one of the things, I guess, going back to your uh, method for distributing cars and, and the plans to make a change, I would just say, speaking for myself, uh, from the time I've been on the board, I've heard discussions and references to the fact that you all were looking at changing uh, your car ordering arrangement. But until I saw Senator Heidkamp's letter yesterday, I was not aware that you had changed it. And so as a member of the board, not knowing that, in fact, CP had actually taken the step of changing it, it makes me wonder how many of your customers, in fact, knew that. I mean, how broadly did you communicate that you were changing, the date when you were changing, how that rollout was going to work? Um, I guess, Vice Chairman Miller, there's, um, uh, you know, maybe communication or, or things, uh, there's, there's always chances to, to, to do better in certain certainly some of those areas on the communication front. But again, I'll, I'll go back and say, um, we're dealing with a, a handful or a couple handful of customers. Um, and, and I'd sit here with um, um, complete confidence that uh, uh, the majority of these have been well aware of this process for, for a long time. And in some cases, 
um, very collaborative in terms of their helping us create what the system looks like. And this has been going on for months and months and months. This, the, it, this is not new. Um, and, the, and the intent was to have it rolled out with the new crop year, August, August 1st. Okay. Uh, going back to the issue of uh, getting cars unloaded, one of the things that we've also heard is that one of the issues that's been a problem for uh, CP is in some cases, maybe this isn't the right way to characterize it, so by all means correct mm -hmm. me, but shippers, particularly on the East Coast, aren't getting cars unloaded and turned back around. Is that sort of a correct understanding? Well, as I explained earlier, um, a unique characteristic of CP's Upper Grain Plains um, network is that we are dependent upon the eastern carriers or connecting carriers in general um, to reach a lot of our markets. And so as a result, when those cars go offline, whether it be um, you know, western shipments to the PNW or, or eastern shipments over Chicago, uh, that dependency on that car getting out to the destination unloaded in a timely manner and back to us is, is critical to our supply capability back, back here. And, um, you know, certainly um, um, as we've watched and begun to track more closely the, the unloads at those destinations, that is an issue that we are concerned with and are trying, trying to address. So, so, yes, you've characterized that correctly. And why, is this like slower than normal or just a common problem but it's, but you know, more concerning in a year when capacity is at such a premium? Um, a little bit of both, um, but, but certainly our awareness um, given capacity at a premium and our desire to try to get these cars back and, and get a lot of these non-trains, it's, it's typically the non-train markets we're talking about. Um, it certainly heightened our focus on trying to work with those customers to say, uh, you know, you've got to get these cars unloaded in, in a timely manner. Do you incentivize um, that in any way? Uh, on the eastern carriers, no, no, we do not. And then finally, um, I, I think in your comments you address this, but I'd, I'd be curious, I want to be sure I'm clear about this. So the, the Canadian government's decision to require CPNCN to deliver a certain number of cars of grain. That is not having any sort of an impact on your U.S. service? Did I understand you to say that? Uh, yes, you did. And we, we, we run um, our Canadian and our U.S. fleets are, are now run independently. So the cars that we have set up to meet the demand in the United States are, are different than the cars that we've set up uh, for our Canadian demand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I apologize in advance. I have a lot of questions. Perhaps as also being a former Senate staffer, we will do some of them in writing <laughs> for the record to, to spare all of you. Maybe, maybe we'll take up a, a new policy here. But um, Mr. Brooks, not mm -hmm. to, you're in the hot seat, so I, I'm just going to keep you there for a few moments, if you don't mind. But phantom orders aside, cancel orders aside, you have 525 car backlog, somebody have, waiting for a car since April, a train since April. I'm like, how are you serving the people that you know you have orders for? I mean, what, you're, they're, they're not all phantom orders. You, you know that, that they're not. Correct. So, so what are you doing to focus attention to get them served? Yeah, so uh, I mean, Part of it is working with those customers and understanding what is a reasonable expectation for service, right? Is 100% growth at an origin station a reasonable expectation for service? I want to serve it. That's how I make money. That's how I return to our shareholders. But is it, but is it reasonable? And what can we do? Um, you know, Commissioner Begaman, um, admittedly, we probably needed to do a hell of a lot better job of of communicating what that expectation should have been with those shippers. But regardless, yes, in that case, we're, we're working on that backlog. In that instance, um, you know, 
where we have a shipper in that case that can can load 25 cars at a time. Um, you know, we've attempted to institute a plan where we're trying to give them 50 at a time. Um, it's not the best utilization um, because we're going to have 20 car, uh, 25 other cars sitting there till they can load the, the other, the first 25, because that's what their track can, can hold. Um, but it's something we're trying to do to get them caught up. Um, there's a couple ways to access some of those shippers. Our, uh, there, there was a comment about not working with our sh short line railroads on alternative routes. Well, we are working with our short lines on al alternative routes. Um, you know, we've got the DMVW short line, which we can connect both at Hankinson and at Max. So we're trying to utilize both of those interchanges more effectively to get cars, in this case, to that shipper. So has the April train been delivered yet, or you're working on that? I believe the April train has, has been delivered, yeah. Um, help me understand, the, with the, the weekly reports that you've been filing with us at our request since June 20th, you know, one of the reasons that we are here in North Dakota is because of your reporting, which, you're, you know, you really haven't made any progress I know that you've been serving customers, certainly some customers. You, um, you've moved like 18,000 carloads since you started reporting. But you know, the trend line didn't change until your customers canceled orders, for the most part, in, in terms of cars fulfilled or orders fulfilled. But your trend line went from a nine-week delay to what last week was a 13-week delay. That's a lot of days of delay. At, at, what, at what point will the delay period start going in the right direction? Yeah, so Besides uh, cancel. Sure. And so you understand, as, as we work with the customers to fill the orders, as I mentioned, in some cases, the orders, the old orders are no longer to markets that exist. So they, they don't so need it. The days keep just at piling on and they're not ever going to... Yeah, so we, we may fill an order that is actually recent because that's the pertinent movement. Or the, the cancellations that came out were a lot of the recent orders versus the old orders. Now, again, um, there's no excuse, and we understand. There are orders out there that are old and need to be filled and will be filled. Um, but part of the effort um, has got to be getting our arms around the reality out there of what these are. And, and we realize we created this with our system, not our shippers. It's not their fault. Um, so the only thing I know that we could do is sit down literally with every one of these folks uh, that have these to try to understand what they need, when they need it by, and a reasonable expectation to when we can get it to them. And, and that's the process. And that is ongoing. That is ongoing. I mean, do you, the, one of the, the PUC commissioners suggested that we needed a field office. Do you have a field office here? I mean, maybe, maybe you need the field office to help facilitate and... Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in, right in Minneapolis, and I've got a team in Minneapolis. I've got a, an employee in Fargo, uh, and we have obviously have uh, all sorts of uh, great men and women that, that run our trains that are all accountable to this, too. So we've, we've got a lot of employees that, in North Dakota that I... Uh, that we're going to be calling upon to, to, to help, um, you know, improve this communication. Um, you know, one thing that uh, we've talked about, and, and, and maybe this goes uh, to, to, your, to your question, Commissioner, is, um, you know, again, I'm going to call on myself to be accountable um, to improve this communication thing, and that's going to start with a, um, you know, a biweekly call um, that all shippers, um, are going to be welcome to join um, to sort of give a state of the, state of the nation. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, talking about the infrastructure improvements uh, that were made and, and where those stands or our hiring efforts or simply where we're at, uh, you know, in terms of expectations on filling orders, um, you know, I think that's uh, part of the accountability on the communication piece that, that, um, that we're going to start up. Well, um, you, you know, one of the things that you didn't mention during your, your testimony, and um, I think you should have, because I, 
You've been working with Rapid City GWI since the May 31st transition. It was a rocky transition, I think, from, for, well, maybe still is a little rocky, but I, I know from at least last week, I think 13 trains moved or so, sort of the, the record number so far. I, I mean, part of that reason is because of the number of locomotives and the coordination that you've been trying to do with Rapid City. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, do more. Keep it up. Um, but I really would like, I, I know in your, the first filing <coughs> on June 27th, one of the things that you indicated in the letter, or I should say Mr. Creel indicated, was mm -hmm. that uh, GWI was planning to bring its own cars online in the fall, but in the meantime, you would augment. It, is that a correct assessment? And, and when will that occur? That's a correct assessment, yes. Uh, we, we have had some supplementary fleet set, you know, brought from CP over the fall. Uh, and in, in this uh, document, I have the actual number, so I'll just quote those quickly. Uh, we actually are bringing uh, 2,089 additional grain cars to rcp and &E. We have 1,175 of those online now already in use. So there's substantially more to come. And in the meantime, we, uh, CP's been very cooperative with supplementing that fleet size so that we have a sufficient number of cars. And, and really since that rockiest, rockiest period in June, we have not had an issue with uh, equipment availability. That's not been the issue. It's just been sheerly moving trains on and off of the line at a much higher grain volume than we anticipated when we set up our planning before June. And I, I believe you, you moved like three additional just grain trains, is that correct? Three additional trains, uh, it, but you know, essentially, the, uh, we, our plan was to operate one train east a day for all commodities. So we operated, we're, we've added three extra trains, but we haven't really increased the volumes of any other commodities. So they're moving within 10 trains at the same volume, and all the rest of the capacity is grain. So you can look at it as three additional trains for grain. And how long do you plan to be able to do that? Until, until demand? Until we, is. yeah, until the, the demand no longer supports it. We have a commitment from our partners at CP to, to supply the equipment as, as needed to com continue that operating plan into the future, I expect, the rest of the year at least. Uh, how are you doing with, I, I know you, you're on your new updated sheet, which I didn't want to read while you were right. talking. But, so long term, what do you envision for that line in South Dakota? Will you maintain 10 trains per week? Will you ultimately, I mean, given the number of cars you plan to bring on, it sounds like you're planning to grow the network. Yes, yeah, certainly it's a, you know, based on the demand of our customers, but we see uh, looking at this year's harvest and, and the backlog that's occurred at, you know, at, both at the farm as well as at the elevators and looking into 2015, uh, uh, and thinking about the 2015 harvest coming in on the back of 2014, it's pretty obvious that this situation is going to continue well into probably through all of 2015. So we, our planning today is to remain uh, sufficiently resourced, especially in people, and and in terms of our locomotive fleet, our plan is to to continue those extra trains for the foreseeable future. We have a slate of capital projects that we have begun to evaluate in terms of a. Uh, new siding is an exciting extension, a different additional yard capacity. We're also actively working on an econ economic development project. So the growth potential is very obvious and strong, and we're going to continue to uh, our, make certain our operating plan is robust enough to support the growth that uh, the demand we have today as well as the growth we expect in the future. So certainly a foreseeable future. In the wintertime, given that Chicago is a one big rail yard in, in many ways. And what I would really like to urge you, Mr. Brooks, is I, and I talked to Mr. Creel about it when I met with him during the last months, but you, you know, I know that you did pull out of CTCO. You know, it really is about communication. I think that's one thing. One, hopefully one of the lessons learned from the last winter situation in Chicago. I would really urge consideration of rejoining or and or how to make it more a more fluid successful operation and with that I kind of like I'd like to hear 
some of your lessons learned through Chicago and winter and you know we're going to have winter services going to lag but what have you done you know what going forward do you know that you at least will do better this time and and that's for you too as well well i think you know one of the items that i touched on um and and certainly i will deliver deliver that message back to uh mr grail um you know, one of the things that we've tried to focus on across um, not only my business unit, but uh, all our business units at CP, um, because we do expect uh, uh, at some point congestion and, and struggles through Chicago, um, is to try to work with our customers to find alternative routes. Um, we'd be crazy not to try to come up with contingencies. Um, um, you know, we fully expect, uh, given the, the automated switch in St. Paul, the, the contingency routing, uh, directional running we have through there to improve our ability to control our own destination to and from Chicago. Um, but, but ultimately, when we get into Chicago, there will be a dependency on our interchange connections. Um, so as part of this, where we can find um, customers and commodities and routes that, that can uh, go around or avoid the Twin City Chicago markets, um, uh, that's something we're trying to do. And, and if you look at CP's network, we've got a northern route um, through Canada that, that comes back down in the northeast U.S. So we've been actively trying to identify all the traffic that currently routes through the Chicago Gateway today um, that we can work with our customers to establish routes and pricing as a contingency. Um, um, through that lane. We've also tried to utilize and we've worked close with the, um, uh, in particular in this case, the CSX to, to uh, improve our interchange capability through Buffalo um, as again, as a means to take traffic out of the Chicago Gateway um, to focus on, on, on other lanes. Yeah, with, with respect to Chicago, really it started in the I guess a blizzard of 2000 that led to the formation of the CTCO and then subsequently the Create Project from there really re-repeated re several of the lessons learned from 2000 in the last winter. So notably among those are, are about twofold. Growth that occurs in Chicago has to be handled in such a way that it conforms in and around the commuter train windows that occur on almost each route that you have, which means you have to have trains very close to Chicago to be able to hit interchange slots in between the carriers. So Steve described in detail what our, our capital expansion plan is for 2014. Well, clearly we're at work on our 15 plan, which is not yet approved, but equally as robust as 14, that now contemplates some expansion away from the North Dakota area and more towards Chicago to be able to improve both fluidity over the line, but also to create capacity at Chicago or near Chicago so that we can stage and hold trains, which we don't like to do, but the criticality of hitting the opportunity in between the commuter train windows is so important. You have to be close to Chicago, so when we hit the afternoon parade or the, the morning parade in between, you have a chance to move trains, we can move trains. And we're doing that by creating staging capability at three separate locations on our route just on the outside of Chicago. Second thing we, we've learned, similar to what Mr. Brooks commented on, and we did it in the last winter, we used alternate gateways. So we took traffic flows away from Chicago, physically moved those towards St. Louis and towards Memphis for both CSX and NS connection. We actually improved velocity by taking outer route movements through that, which says, how, how can we leverage that more fully? So that end, we're active and underway right now with one of the Eastern roads, really putting in place a connection that existed probably on the order of 20 to 25 years ago that's no longer being used in central Illinois as a way to bypass Chicago. It adds on the order of about 130 route miles, but it keeps that train out of Chicago, keeps it out of the commuter train windows, and allows us to probably improve the overall throughput and velocity by using it. Third piece is, the, the in, each of you mentioned in your own way, and, and that is the critical nature of the Chicago Transportation Coordination Office, CTCO that we were all a part of at one time. I mean, that's critically important because we do rely on two big switching carriers, the Belt Railway Company, the BRC, and the Indiana Harbor Belt. And, and we saw it through the winter. When the BRC inventory gets above 4,000, which it was for some period of time, 
all of Chicago starts to slow down. Same is true with the IHB. So that means each of us have to do our part to flow traffic in and to move it out. Now, in, in recent, recent time, Canadian Pacific right now is way over their allocation going to BRC, and each of us feel it. As they move more traffic in, there's less slots available for the rest of us. So that coordination of volume, coordination of flows is really important. So it's those three things, alternate junctions and gateways, chambering capacity near Chicago to hit slots in between windows, and leveraging our participation in CTCO. I think those are our three big lessons. No, no different what they were in 2000, same thing we relearned in 2014. Uh, could you comment a bit more? Um, you touched on the fact that your single car trains, that you really you know, you broke about, apart your shuttles in order to really get the grain backlog, ag backlog, taking down to 2,000, I guess is what your, your current number. I think what you're doing is you're kind of cluing us in that the orders for single, you know, people are going to start seeing a bigger backlog unless they can utilize the shuttle services. Is that somewhat what you're trying to forecast for us? Because you can move the greatest amount of grain using the shuttle. We're, I'm really touching on a, a couple of uh, a couple of items that are interwoven. Uh, first is we are transitioning the fleet back to a more normal balance. So we're we're not doing something that we haven't done in the past. And that is where we had a specific plan as our shuttle deck decreased coming into the summer to take those cars and put them against our past due. So it was a, it was a lever that we could pull to go out and, and get caught up. As we come into the fall, we need to transition those cars back into the, into the shuttle. So first, being transparent that we are, we are doing that. Second, uh, it is a feature of our program that once a car is trips into its fourth day past its want date, it will go into what we report as past due. And so it is not unusual as we come into harvest to see those past dues come up. Certainly what we experienced last year was, uh, while not historic in terms of uh, magnitude of past dues, it was a level that, uh, that we wouldn't want to get back to. Um, but we would expect in a normal harvest to see our, our past dues normally, normally ramp up depending upon how fast the harvest, how fast the harvest comes in. And then the third message is yes, our, our shuttle network, while it has slightly over half of the rail cars in it, will tend to move approximately 70% of our volume as we move into the fall. And I was trying to jot down quickly what you were saying at the time, but I, I may have gotten it wrong, but did you say 51% of your cars go to shuttle or 51% of elevators can be served by a shuttle? 51% of our rail cars um, in October will be in shuttle service. Okay. And, and can you give me a sense of how many elevators are able to utilize that service compared to those that cannot? Um, Bob, yeah, can, can you touch on that? We have on the order of 6,000 origins that can load a grain car and about 210 shuttle qualified equipped locations. Yeah, our, our, shuttle, uh, our shuttle network is on our website as well as the qualifications for being one. It's, it's been developed since 2000, actually starting in 1999 is when we began developing it. Um, back, back to you, Mr. Brown, and, and a bit to you, Mr. Brooks, because I want you to stay in that hot seat. Um, you know, when, when Rapid City was created on May 31st. Um, it, it did not have a zero, I mean, although on record you, you would say there was a zero backlog because you started fresh. Um, I know that there was approximately 6,800 car backlog on the old CP DM&E line. And you know, looking at the number of cars that, for example, CP has been able to provide since June to now, I mean, that back, you know, how do you, you still, so you have this big backlog, even though it's maybe only in my mind and the shippers that want to be served, but not a, on paper. And then you have not gotten the number of cars that you at least had requested from CP up at, I mean, I think about maybe there are two thirds of the requests have been met, but maybe you asked for 500, you got like, of the 5,000 you've requested since you started, I believe 3,100 have been supplied. So there's, there's a growing gap is, is what my 
convoluted point is. So how do, it seems like the backlog is pretty imminent still on, or for your shippers. At what point can it get cleared out? Or is it just a matter of the 13 cars chugging along and eventually be yeah, patient? It's a, yeah, it's, of course, we started fresh on June 1st. We, and g and has its own car ordering system. It's different than CPs. So we, of course, spent, did a lot of work with our customers before that to make sure they understood how to order cars on our CP and E. And we began using that system, which did create the impression, you know, that there was they were current for the period of time until the orders began to exceed exceed the actual loadings, and that that has occurred to some degree. Um, we initially found the car uh, supply coming from CP to be inadequate to some degree, uh, which was reported. Uh, we have, of course, over time that's improved fairly dramatically, which is also evident in our reportings as well as in our weekly uh, discussions with, with the SDB. Um, there was, what, what really occurred was there became a, uh, a, back, so a little bit of a backlog of loaded cars online. So instead of having a backlog of empties, there was actually more loaded cars online than we really had sufficient capacity to handle. That's why when we... It was capacity or was it crew? Was it locomotives or... It was more the fact that uh, it was more the fact the balance of locomotives between CP and RCP and E. Uh, the you know the, the fundamental fact is it takes more locomotives to go east than it does to go west. So once we got it into balance and understanding and good cooperation from, from CP about it, just make sure you give us the same number of locomotives back with the westbound train that you give that we give you with the eastbound train. We can balance this out, which has happened. That at our 60-day checkup, we did a 60-day checkup with CP which happened to be coincidentally the day before the meeting we had with, in Washington on August the 8th. So we met with CP on August the 7th and um, did a little checkup and, and just went, reworked our operating plan cooperatively with the operating uh, team from CP. And from that day since, we have uh, seen a great deal of improvement in a locomotive balance. So in fact, you know, they were oversupplied uh, for some period of time as we worked on making sure that our horsepower hours balanced between the two railroads. So what that says is over the, about the last three to four weeks, we've largely cured the locomotive uh, challenges that we've had, and with, that's allowed us to move more loaded cars offline. Therefore, that creates capacity to bring more empty equipment online, and, and now, now we begin to be able to uh, cycle equipment on the rcp &E more quickly because it's not a matter of the speed of loading. When we place cars that our customers are loaded immediately, obviously they want the cars, they have the product, so they're loaded immediately and we appreciate that and we're able to then go back and get the cars and uh, decrease the cycle time of a loaded car from the, when it's released loaded to we uh, deliver it to our interchange carrier, whether that be UP or, or CP and as far as the car load business is concerned. When you bring cars online in the fall, will you be bringing locomotives with them? Our fleet of locomotives is set at the number, at, at the maximum number that we we have ourselves. What we're doing is balancing uh, locomotives between CP and RCP and E. So, so when we send a train to CP, it may have RCP and E locomotives, but we get one back. We get one from CP to balance that, and so. Uh, if, if we need to ad adapt the fleet size to operate even more trains, then we will uh, we'll, we'll bring additional locomotives to the, to the RCP and E. And if you did that, would that not free up locomotives for Mr. Brooks to move more North Dakota product? Am I being too simplistic? Yeah, actually, what we're trying to do is we ha we maintain a instead of paying each other for the use of each other's locomotives, we balance that out by hours. It's called horsepower hours. So what we're trying to do is balance that. And it, in the initial two months, the balance of the horsepower hours was greatly in favor of the RCP and E because more RCP and E locomotives went east than CP locomotives came back west. So we have to just keep that balanced. Now, if if we were to bring more RCP and E locomotives into the operation, they would essentially become locomotives that would be operating more on CP than on RCP and E which means that there would be the, a, a problem with how the locomotive hours are balanced. Uh, Mr. Brooks, could you, you mentioned that last October was your record. What, what was that record in terms of 
I guess, volume or ton miles or which, however you wanted to. I'll, I'll have to look, but in the context of it, um, um, you know, our shipments in October of last year from our U.S. franchise to export PNW, that's what I was saying. It was our largest shipment month ever for the history of a franchise. I don't have specifically number of carloads that, but I, we can certainly report that back to you. Okay. And we'll have another chance to talk to you later this afternoon. So I guess for now, I will, I will stop and thank you all.